Socialism Confounds Government and Society by Frederic Bastier, an audio Mises Daily narrated by Joel Sams. This article is excerpted from the Bastier Collection, available at the Mises Bookstore, mises.org forward slash store. Socialism, like the old policy from which it emanates, confounds government and society, and so every time we object to a thing being done by government, it concludes that we object to its being done at all. We disapprove of education by the state, then we are against education altogether. We object to a state religion, then we would have no religion at all. We object to an equality which is brought about by the state, then we are against equality, etc., etc. They might as well accuse us of wishing men not to eat, because we object to the cultivation of corn by the state. How is it that the strange idea of making the law produce what it does not contain, prosperity, in a positive sense, wealth, science, religion, should ever have gained ground in the political world. The modern politicians, particularly those of the socialist school, found their different theories upon one common hypothesis, and surely a more strange, a more presumptuous notion could never have entered a human brain. They divide mankind into two parts. Men in general except one, form the first. The politician himself forms the second, which is by far the most important. In fact, they begin by supposing that men are devoid of any principle of action, and of any means of discernment in themselves, that they have no initiative, that they are inert matter, passive particles, atoms without impulse, at best a vegetation indifferent to its own mode of existence, susceptible of assuming from an exterior will and hand an infinite number of forms, more or less symmetrical, artistic, and perfected. Moreover, every one of these politicians does not hesitate to assume that he himself is, under the names of organizer, discoverer, legislator, institutor, or founder, this will and hand, this universal initiative, this creative power, whose sublime mission it is to gather together these scattered materials, that is, men, into society. Starting from these data, as a gardener, according to his caprice, shapes his trees into pyramids, parasols, cubes, cones, vases, espaliers, distaffs, or fans, so the socialist, following his chimera, shapes poor humanity into groups, series, circles, subcircles, honeycombs, or social workshops with all kinds of variations. And as the gardener, to bring his trees into shape, needs hatchets, pruning hooks, saws, and shears, so the politician, to bring society into shape, needs the forces which he can only find in the laws, the law of tariffs, the law of taxation, the law of assistance, and the law of education. It is so true that the socialists look upon mankind as a subject for social experiments, that if, by chance, they are not quite certain of the success of these experiments, they will request a portion of mankind as a subject to experiment upon. It is well known how popular the idea of trying all systems is, and one of their chiefs has been known seriously to demand of the constituent assembly a parish with all its inhabitants upon which to make his experiments. It is thus that an inventor will make a small machine before he makes one of the regular size. Thus the chemist sacrifices some substances, the agriculturalist some seed in a corner of his field, to make trial of an idea. But think of the difference between the gardener and his trees, between the inventor and his machine, between the chemist and his substances, between the agriculturalist and his seed. The socialist thinks in all sincerity that there is the same difference between himself and mankind. No wonder the politicians of the nineteenth century look upon society as an artificial production of the legislator's genius. This idea, the result of a classical education, has taken possession of all the thinkers and great writers of our country. To all these persons, the relations between mankind and the legislator appear to be the same as those that exist between the clay and the potter. Moreover, if they have consented to recognize in the heart of man a capability of action, and in his intellect a faculty of discernment, they have looked upon this gift of God as a fatal one, and thought that mankind under these two impulses tended fatally towards ruin. They have taken it for granted that if abandoned to their own inclinations, men would only occupy themselves with religion to arrive at atheism, with instruction to come to ignorance, and with labor in exchange to be extinguished in misery. 
Happily, according to these writers, there are some men, termed governors and legislators, upon whom heaven has bestowed opposite tendencies, not for their own sake only, but for the sake of the rest of the world. Whilst mankind tends to evil, they incline to good. Whilst mankind is advancing towards darkness, they are aspiring to enlightenment. Whilst mankind is drawn towards vice, they are attracted by virtue. And, this granted, they demand the assistance of force, by means of which they are to substitute their own tendencies for those of the human race. It is only needful to open almost at random a book on philosophy, politics, or history to see how strongly this idea, the child of classical studies and the mother of socialism, is rooted in our country, that mankind is merely inert matter, receiving life, organization, morality, and wealth from power, or rather, and still worse, that mankind itself tends towards degradation. And is only arrested in its tendency by the mysterious hand of the legislator. Classical conventionalism shows us everywhere behind passive society a hidden power under the names of law or legislator or by a mode of expression which refers to some person or persons of undisputed weight and authority but not named, which moves, animates, enriches, and regenerates mankind. We will give a quotation from Bossuet. One of the things which was the most strongly impressed, by whom, upon the mind of the Egyptians was the love of their country. Nobody was allowed to be useless to the state. The law assigned to everyone his employment, which descended from father to son. No one was permitted to have two professions, nor to adopt another. But there was one occupation which was obliged to be common to all. This was the study of the laws and of wisdom. Ignorance of religion and the political regulations of the country was excused in no condition of life. Moreover, every profession had a district assigned to it. By whom? Amongst good laws, one of the best things was that everybody was taught to observe them. By whom? Egypt abounded with wonderful inventions, and nothing was neglected which could render life comfortable and tranquil. Thus, Men, according to Bossuet, derive nothing from themselves. Patriotism, wealth, inventions, husbandry, science, all come to them by the operation of the laws, or by kings. All they have to do is to be passive. It is on this ground that Bossuet takes exception when Diodorus accuses the Egyptians of rejecting wrestling and music. How is that possible, says he, since these arts were invented by Trismegistus? It is the same with the Persians. One of the first cares of the prince was to encourage agriculture. As there were posts established for the regulation of the armies, so there were officers for the superintending of rural works. The respect with which the Persians were inspired for royal authority was excessive. The Greeks, although full of mind, were no less strangers to their own responsibilities, so much so that of themselves, like dogs and horses, they would not have ventured upon the most simple games. In a classical sense, it is an undisputed thing that everything comes to the people from without. The Greeks, naturally full of spirit and courage, had been early cultivated by kings and colonies who had come from Egypt. From them they had learned the exercises of the body, foot races and horse and chariot races. The best thing that the Egyptians had taught them was to become docile and to allow themselves to be formed by the laws for the public good. Fenelon, reared in the study and admiration of antiquity and a witness of the power of Louis the Fourteenth, Fenelon naturally adopted the idea that mankind should be passive, and that its misfortunes and its prosperities, its virtues and its vices. Are caused by the external influence that is exercised upon it by the law or by the makers of the law. Thus, in his Utopia of Salentum, he brings the men with their interests, their faculties, their desires, and their possessions under the absolute direction of the legislator. Whatever the subject may be, they themselves have no voice in it. The prince judges for them. The nation is just a shapeless mass of which the prince is the soul. In him resides the thought, the foresight, the principle of all organization, of all progress. On him, therefore, rests all the responsibility. In proof of this assertion, 
I might transcribe the whole of the tenth book of Telemachus. I refer the reader to it, and shall content myself with quoting some passages taken at random from this celebrated work, to which, in every other respect, I am the first to render justice. With the astonishing credulity that characterizes the classics, Fenelon, against the authority of reason and of facts, admits the general felicity of the Egyptians, and attributes it not to their own wisdom, but to that of their kings. We could not turn our eyes to the two shores without perceiving rich towns and country seats agreeably situated, fields that were covered every year without intermission with golden crops, meadows full of flocks, laborers bending under the weight of fruits that the earth lavished on its cultivators, and shepherds who made the echoes around repeat the soft sounds of their pipes and flutes. Happy, said Mentor, is that people who is governed by a wise king. Mentor afterwards desired me to remark the happiness and abundance that was spread over all the country of Egypt, where twenty-two thousand cities might be counted. He admired the excellent police regulations of the cities, the justice administered in favor of the poor against the rich, the good education of the children, who were accustomed to obedience, labor, and the love of arts and letters, the exactness with which all the ceremonies of religion were performed, the disinterestedness, the desire of honor, the fidelity to men, and the fear of the gods with which every father inspired his children. He could not sufficiently admire the prosperous state of the country. Happy, said he, is the people whom a wise king rules in such a manner. Fenelon's idyll on Crete is still more fascinating. Mentor is made to say, All that you will see in this wonderful island is the result of the laws of Minos. The education that the children receive renders the body healthy and robust. They are accustomed from the first to a frugal and laborious life. It is supposed that all the pleasures of sense enervate the body and the mind. No other pleasure is presented to them but that of being invincible by virtue, that of acquiring much glory. There they punish three vices that go unpunished amongst other people, ingratitude, dissimulation, and avarice. As to pomp and dissipation, there is no need to punish these, for they are unknown in Crete. No costly furniture... No magnificent clothing, no delicious feasts, no gilded palaces are allowed. It is thus that Mentor prepares his scholar to mould and manipulate, doubtless with the most philanthropic intentions, the people of Ithaca. And to confirm him in these ideas, he gives them the example of Salentum. So we receive our first political notions. We are taught to treat men very much as Oliver de Serre teaches farmers to manage and to mix the soil. Montesquieu. To sustain the spirit of commerce, it is necessary that all the laws should favor it, that these same laws, by their regulations in dividing the fortunes in proportion as commerce enlarges them, should place every poor citizen in sufficiently easy circumstances to enable him to work like the others, and every rich citizen in such mediocrity that he must work in order to retain or to acquire. Thus the laws are to dispose of all fortunes. Although in a democracy real equality be the soul of the state, yet it is so difficult to establish that an extreme exactness in this matter would not always be desirable. It is sufficient that a census be established to reduce or fix the differences to a certain point, after which it is for particular laws to equalize, as it were, the inequality by burdens imposed upon the rich and reliefs granted to the poor. Here again we see the equalization of fortunes by law, that is, by force. There were in Greece two kinds of republics. One was military, as Sparta, the other commercial, as Athens. In the one it was wished, by whom, that the citizens should be idle. In the other, the love of labor was encouraged. It is worth our while to pay a little attention to the extent of genius required by these legislators, that we may see how, by confounding all the virtues, they showed their wisdom to the world. Lycurgus, blending theft with the spirit of justice, the hardest slavery with extreme liberty, the most atrocious sentiments with the greatest moderation, gave stability to his city. He seemed to deprive it of all its resources, arts, commerce, money, and walls. There was ambition without the hope of rising. There were natural sentiments where the individual was neither child nor husband nor father. 
Chastity was even deprived of modesty. By this road, Sparta was led on to grandeur and to glory. The phenomenon that we observe in the institutions of Greece has been seen in the midst of the degeneracy and corruption of our modern times. An honest legislator has formed a people where probity has appeared as natural as bravery among the Spartans. Mr. Penn is a true Lycurgus, and although the former had peace for his object and the latter war, they resemble each other in the singular path along which they have led their people, in the influence over free men, in the prejudices which they have overcome, the passions they have subdued. Paraguay furnishes us with another example. Society has been accused of the crime of regarding the pleasure of commanding as the only good of life, but it will always be a noble thing to govern men by making them happy. Those who desire to form similar institutions will establish community of property, as in the Republic of Plato, the same reverence as he enjoined for the gods, separation from strangers for the preservation of morality, and make the city and not the citizens create commerce. They should give our arts without our luxury. Our wants without our desires. Vulgar infatuation may exclaim if it likes. It is Montesquieu, magnificent, sublime. I am not afraid to express my opinion and to say what you have the gall to call that fine. It is frightful. It is abominable. And these extracts, which I might multiply, show that according to Montesquieu, the persons, the liberties, the properties, mankind itself, are nothing but grist for the mill of the sagacity of lawgivers. Rousseau, although this politician, the paramount authority of the Democrats, makes the social edifice rest upon the general will, no one has so completely admitted the hypothesis of the entire passiveness of human nature in the presence of the lawgiver. If it is true that a great prince is a rare thing, how much more so must a great lawgiver be? The former has only to follow the pattern proposed to him by the latter. This latter is the engineer who invents the machine. The former is merely the workman who sets it in motion. And what part of men to act in all this? That of the machine which is set in motion, or rather, are they not the brute matter of which the machine is made? Thus, between the legislator and the prince, between the prince and his subjects, there are the same relations as those that exist between the agricultural writer and the agriculturalist, the agriculturalist and the clod. At what a vast height then is the politician placed, who rules over legislators themselves and teaches them their trade in such imperative terms as the following: Would you give consistency to the state? Bring the extremes together as much as possible. Suffer neither wealthy persons nor beggars. If the soil is poor and barren, or if the country too much confined for the inhabitants, turn to industry and the arts, whose productions you will exchange for the provisions which you require. On a good soil, if you are short of inhabitants, give all your attention to agriculture, which multiplies men, and banish the arts, which only serve to depopulate the country. Pay attention to extensive and convenient coasts. Cover the sea with vessels, and you will have a brilliant and short existence. If your seas wash only inaccessible rocks, let the people be barbarous and eat fish. They will live more quietly, perhaps better, and most certainly more happily. In short. Besides those maxims which are common to all, every people has its own particular circumstances which demand a legislation peculiar to itself. It was thus that the Hebrews formerly and the Arabs more recently had religion for their principal object. That of the Athenians was literature, that of Carthage entire commerce, of Rhodes naval affairs, of Sparta war, and of Rome virtue. The author of the Spirit of Laws has shown the art by which the legislator should frame his institutions towards each of these objects. But if the legislator, mistaking his object, should take up a principle different from that which arises from the nature of things, if one should tend to slavery and the other to liberty, if one to wealth and the other to population, one to peace and the other to conquests, the laws will insensibly become enfeebled, the constitution will be impaired, and the state will be subject to incessant agitations until it is destroyed or becomes changed, and invisible nature regains her empire. But if nature is sufficiently invincible to regain its empire, why does not Rousseau admit that it had no need of the legislator to gain its empire from the beginning? 
Why does he not allow that by obeying their own impulse, men would of themselves apply agriculture to a fertile district, and commerce to extensive and commodious coasts, without the interference of a Lycurgus, a Solon, or a Rousseau, who would undertake it at the risk of deceiving themselves? Be that as it may, we see with what a terrible responsibility Rousseau invests inventors, institutors, conductors, and manipulators of societies. He is therefore very exacting with regard to them. He who dares to undertake the institutions of a people ought to feel that he can, as it were, transform every individual who is by himself a perfect and solitary whole, receiving his life and being from a larger whole of which he forms a part. He must feel that he can change the constitution of man to fortify it and to substitute a social and moral existence for the physical and independent one that we have all received from nature. In a word, he must deprive man of his own powers to give him others that are foreign to him. Poor human nature! What would become of its dignity if it were entrusted to the disciples of Rousseau? Reynal, the climate, that is, the air and the soil. Is the first element for the legislator. His resources prescribe to him his duties. First, he must consult his local position. A population dwelling upon maritime shores must have laws fitted for navigation. If the colony is located in an inland region, a legislator must provide for the nature of the soil and for its degree of fertility. It is more especially in the distribution of property that the wisdom of legislation will appear. As a general rule, and in every country, when a new colony is founded, land should be given to each man sufficient for the support of his family. In an uncultivated land, which you are colonizing with children, it will only be needful to let the germs of truth expand in the developments of reason. But when you establish old people in a new country, the skill consists in only allowing it those injurious opinions and customs which it is impossible to cure and correct. If you wish to prevent them from being perpetuated, you will act upon the rising generation by a general and public education of the children. A prince or legislator ought never to found a colony without previously sending wise men there to instruct the youth. In a new colony, every facility is open to the precautions of the legislator who desires to purify the tone and the manners of the people. If he has genius and virtue, the lands and the men that are at his disposal will inspire his soul with a plan of society that a writer can only vaguely trace, and in a way that would be subject to the instability of all hypotheses, which are varied and complicated by an infinity of circumstances too difficult to foresee and to combine. One would think it was a professor of agriculture who, saying to his pupils, "The climate is the only rule for the agriculturalist." His resources dictate to him his duties. The first thing he has to consider is his local position. If he is on a clay soil, he must do so and so. If he has to contend with sand, this is the way in which he must set about it. Every facility is open to the agriculturalist who wishes to clear and improve his soil. If he only has the skill, the manure which he has at his disposal will suggest to him a plan of operation which a professor can only vaguely trace, and in a way that would be subject to the uncertainty of all hypotheses, which vary and are complicated by an infinity of circumstances too difficult to foresee and to combine. But oh, sublime writers! Deign to remember sometimes that this clay, this sand, this manure of which you are disposing in so arbitrary a manner, are men, your equals, intelligent and free beings like yourselves, who have received from God as you have the faculty of seeing, of foreseeing, of thinking, and of judging for themselves. Mably, he is supposing the laws to be worn out by time and by the neglect of security, and continues thus: Under these circumstances, we must be convinced that the bonds of government are slack. Give them a new tension. It is the reader who is addressed, and the evil will be remedied. Think less of punishing the faults than of encouraging the virtues that you want. By this method, you will bestow upon your republic the vigor of youth. Through ignorance of this, a free people has lost its liberty. But if the evil has made so much way that the ordinary magistrates are unable to remedy it effectually, have recourse to an extraordinary magistracy, whose time should be short and its power considerable. The imagination of the citizens requires to be impressed. In this style, he goes on through 
twenty volumes. There was a time when, under the influence of teaching like this, which is the foundation of classical education, everyone was for placing himself beyond and above mankind for the sake of arranging, organizing, and instituting it in his own way. Condillac, take upon yourself, my lord, the character of Lycurgus or of Solon. Before you finish reading this essay, amuse yourself with giving laws to some wild people in America or in Africa. Establish these roving men in fixed dwellings. Teach them to keep flocks. Endeavor to develop the social qualities that nature has implanted in them. Make them begin to practice the duties of humanity. Cause the pleasures of the passions to become distasteful to them by punishments, and you will see these barbarians, with every plan of your legislation, lose a vice and gain a virtue. All these people have had laws, but few among them have been happy. Why is this? Because legislators have almost always been ignorant of the object of society, which is to unite families by a common interest. Impartiality in law consists in two things: in establishing equality in the fortunes and in the dignity of the citizens. In proportion to the degree of equality established by the laws, the dearer will they become to every citizen. How can avarice, ambition, dissipation, idleness, sloth, envy, hatred, or jealousy agitate men who are equal in fortune and dignity, and to whom the laws leave no hope of disturbing their equality? What has been told you of the Republic of Sparta ought to enlighten you on this question. No other state has had laws more in accordance with the order of nature or of equality. It is not to be wondered at that the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries should have looked upon the human race as inert matter, ready to receive everything—form, figure, impulse, movement, and life—from a great prince or a great legislator or a great genius. These ages were reared in the study of antiquity, and antiquity presents everywhere in Egypt, Persia, Greece, and Rome the spectacle of a few men moulding mankind according to their fancy, and mankind to this end enslaved by force or by imposture. And what does this prove? That because men and society are improvable, error, ignorance, despotism, slavery, and superstition must be more prevalent in early times. The mistake of the writers quoted above is not that they have asserted this fact, but that they have proposed it as a rule for the admiration and imitation of future generations. Their mistake has been, with an inconceivable absence of discernment and upon the faith of a puerile conventionalism, that they have admitted what is inadmissible, viz., the grandeur, dignity, morality, and well-being of the artificial societies of the ancient world. They have not understood that time produces and spreads enlightenment. And that in proportion to the increase of enlightenment, right ceases to be upheld by force, and society regains possession of herself. And in fact, what is the political work that we are endeavouring to promote? It is no other than the instinctive effort of every people towards liberty. And what is liberty, whose name can make every heart beat and which can agitate the world? But the union of all liberties, the liberty of conscience, of education, of association, of the press, of movement, of labour, and of exchange—in other words, the free exercise for all of all the inoffensive faculties—and again, in other words, the destruction of all despotisms, even of legal despotism, and the reduction of law to its only rational sphere, which is to regulate the individual right of legitimate defence or to repress injustice. This tendency of the human race, it must be admitted, is greatly thwarted, particularly in our country, by the fatal disposition resulting from classical teaching and common to all politicians of placing themselves beyond mankind, to arrange, organize, and regulate it according to their fancy. For whilst society is struggling to realize liberty. The great men who place themselves at its head, imbued with the principles of the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries, think only of subjecting it to the philanthropic despotism of their social inventions and making it bear with docility, according to the expression of Rousseau, the yoke of public felicity as pictured in their own imaginations. This was particularly the case in seventeen eighty nine. No sooner was the old system destroyed than society was to be submitted to other artificial arrangements, always with the same starting point: the omnipotence of the law. Saint Just, the legislator, commands the future. 
It is for him to will for the good of mankind. It is for him to make men what he wishes them to be. Robespierre, the function of government is to direct the physical and moral powers of the nation towards the object of its institution. Biovarin, a people who are to be restored to liberty must be formed anew. Ancient prejudices must be destroyed, antiquated customs changed, depraved affections corrected, inveterate vices eradicated. For this, a strong force and a vehement impulse will be necessary. Citizens, the inflexible austerity of Lycurgus created the firm basis of the Spartan Republic. The feeble and trusting disposition of Solon plunged Athens into slavery. This parallel contains the whole science of government. Le Pelletier, considering the extent of human degradation, I am convinced of the necessity of effecting an entire regeneration of the race, and, if I may so express myself, of creating a new people. Men, therefore, are nothing but raw material. It is not for them to will their own improvement. They are not capable of it, according to Saint-Just. It is only the legislator who is. Men are merely to be what he wills that they should be. According to Robespierre, who copies Rousseau literally, the legislator is to begin by assigning the aim of the institutions of the nation. After this, the government has only to direct all its physical and moral forces towards this end. All this time, the nation itself is to remain perfectly passive, and Biod Varenne would teach us that it ought to have no prejudices, affections, nor wants, but such as are authorized by the legislator. He even goes so far as to say that the inflexible austerity of a man is the basis of a republic. We have seen that in cases where the evil is so great that the ordinary magistrates are unable to remedy it, Mably recommends a dictatorship to promote virtue. Have recourse, he says, to an extraordinary magistracy whose time shall be short and his power considerable. The imagination of the people requires to be impressed. This doctrine has not been neglected. Listen to Robespierre. The principle of the Republican government is virtue and the means to be adopted during its establishment is terror. We want to substitute in our country morality for self-indulgence, probity for honor, principles for customs, duties for decorum, the empire of reason for the tyranny of fashion, contempt of vice for contempt of misfortune, pride for insolence, greatness of soul for vanity, love of glory for love of money, good people for good company, merit for intrigue, genius for wit, truth for glitter, the charm of happiness for the weariness of pleasure, the greatness of man for the littleness of the great, a magnanimous, powerful, happy people, for one that is easy, frivolous, degraded. That is to say we would substitute all the virtues and miracles of a republic for all the vices and absurdities of monarchy. At what a vast height above the rest of mankind does Robespierre place himself here? And observe the arrogance with which he speaks. He's not content with expressing a desire for a great renovation of the human heart. He does not even expect such a result from a regular government. No, he intends to effect it himself and by means of terror. The object of the discourse from which this puerile and laborious mass of antithesis is extracted was to exhibit the principles of morality that ought to direct a revolutionary government. Moreover, when Robespierre asks for a dictatorship, it is not merely for the purpose of repelling a foreign enemy or of putting down factions. It is that he may establish by means of terror and as a preliminary to the operation of the Constitution, his own principles of morality. He pretends to nothing short of extirpating from the country by means of terror, self-interest, honor, customs, decorum, fashion, vanity, the love of money, good company, intrigue, wit, luxury, and misery. It is not until after he, Robespierre, shall have accomplished these miracles, as he rightly calls them, that he will allow the law to regain her empire. Truly, it would be well if these visionaries who think so much of themselves and so little of mankind, who want to renew everything, would only be content with trying to reform themselves. The task would be arduous enough for them. In general, however, these gentlemen, the reformers, legislators, and politicians, do not desire to exercise an immediate despotism over mankind. No, they are too moderate and too philanthropic for that. They only contend for the despotism, the absolutism, the omnipotence of the law. They aspire only to make the law. 
Frédéric Bastia was the great French proto-Austro-Libertarian whose polemics and analytics run circles around every statist cliché. His primary desire as a writer was to reach people in the most practical way with the message of the moral and material urgency of freedom. The Ludwig von Mises Institute hopes that you have enjoyed this audio Mises daily. For a world of free market literature, media and discussion, visit Mises.org.